Hello and welcome back to Paris. It's only about 15 minutes since we left you, so I hope you're stocked up with a fresh cup of tea or a fresh beer or a bottle of wine or whatever you need to watch uh, the speed climbing finals. We're going to start off in about five minutes' time with the men's speed climbing final. That will be followed immediately by the women's lead climbing final. I'm Charlie Roscoe. Here alongside me today is Alexander Bosey and, of course, Mike Langley, who's been with me for the duration. And... Alex, you are the British record holder. I know you're not big on bigging yourself up, but you're the British record holder in speed climbing. So, and tell us what it what it's like for you to what, to see speed climbing on a stage like this. Well, it's pretty incredible. the The crowd here and everything is is massive, and I've never been to a climbing competition of any discipline that there's anything like this. And to have this kind of crowd in a speed comp and everything is is huge. So. I think what's interesting this week, Alex, is obviously with the Olympic bid uh, being successful, speed climbing is included in that. The vibe around the arena for speed climbing seems to have ramped up, uh, ramped up massively. Can you tell us um, just why is it that you chose speed climbing? What is it that excites you as an athlete to get involved in the speed? I think speed climbing for me was kind of the most sort of logical form of climbing for me. I. I came from swimming originally, I wasn't competitive in swimming, but I did it a lot and I didn't enjoy racing and swimming, but the same sort of races are similar to speed and that's just kind of where I slotted in and yeah. Just to run you through our, our starting list, we will have uh, 16 men, we won't have quite have time to run through all the names, but you can see them up on your screen there, 16 will become 8, will become 4, will become 2, will become 1. Just remember in speed climbing that they're all aiming for what we call the big final. That is effectively who's going to win the gold and silver medal. And then the bronze medal is decided by what we call a small final. In other sports, it's called a third, fourth playoff. We call it a small final in speed climbing. So it's the big final and the small, climb, the small final. That's what they're all aiming for. One thing I should point out before we get underway with the competition here is unfortunately this wall has not been certified as a world record wall so if we see a time faster than the existing world records it will not be an official world record the reason for that is that the speed wall is put under a huge amount of tests and these are extremely precise the the wall failed by one millimeter i'm told in the precision test where they measure that all the holes and all the panels are exactly as they should be the reason for that is the wall is made up of 15 panels. Obviously, there, with those 15 panels, there are 14 joins where the panels all meet. If there is a two mil difference on each panel, 14 joins, two millimeters, that's a 28 millimeter difference over data that's been studied over time, over lots and lots of competitions, it's been shown that that's enough to affect the competitor's time by one hundredth of a second, which of course is the key number because that is a number that could decide a race. So I hope that's not a too winded and overly complicated version of what happened. Um, we're going to be using Alex here for some unique insights into speed climbing just before the first race. Alex, you can see the guys just off to our left warming up. What is different about the warm-up routine for speed than it would be for, say, lead or boulder? Well, obviously in, in lead or boulder you've got a lot more time, you're, you're on the wall a lot longer, you need to be sort of warmed up to do a lot of moves. In speed, you're, you're, not, you're on the wall for less than 10 seconds, so your warm-up's much more explosive, it's much more about warming up for that power rather than for endurance. And speaking of power and explosiveness, Razor Ali Porshane is Andy Far. we'll call him Ali Porshane for the sake of uh, speed, fittingly enough here, is back. We haven't seen him in the most recent World Cups, 
but he's very much back. The unmistakable figure on the left of your screen there, Konstantin Pavlenko, takes him on in the first race. Pavlenko on the right, Ali Porshena on the left. As I say, just remind you, this is not a world record certified wall. The distance it failed by when the measurements are made to make sure that all the holes and the panels are in exactly the right place was one millimetre, but that is enough of a difference to not make it a world record wall. Such is life. Ali Porshena on the left, Pavlenko on the right. Ali Porshena, surely the favourite here, and he gets a good start, but so did Pavlenko, but it's Ali Porshena who looks like he's got this one by less than a metre, as things stand, he does take it. Pretty close first race, though, for Ali Porshena. Incredible start here to the speed uh, final. Straight off the bat, a really, really close run. Alex, you can see uh, on this run it was great, there was no slips, but how long does it take to be able to climb like these guys? What level of training, how many years does it take to get the muscle memory to, to fire off every single hold, hit it perfectly? It, it takes a long time. You've got to, you know, you need to hit every single hold perfectly. If one foot is, is out by as even a centimetre, it completely throws you and it's really hard to recover from that at, in a race. So you need... It takes a lot of runs, a lot of practice, so you're absolutely dialed. You're not thinking about where your feet are going, you're not thinking where your hands are. It's all second nature, and it's just perfect every time. And just to let you know, out on the stage now, Leonardo Zontero of Italy. We've seen a lot of him this season, had a really good year, but he's taking on Xi Xin Song of China. Immensely successful speed climber in years past. Had a bit of a sabbatical from competitions, although uh, I saw him in Chongqing. We filmed an interview with him back in April in Chongqing that you may have seen on the IFSC Facebook page. He's said all along he wants to be back in Paris, back in action, and here he is. He's waited a long time for this. First time we've seen him in the IFSC this year. Has he still got it? That's the question. John Terrio's on the left, Chong on the right. <laughs> And a bit of a sluggish start from both of them there. Our cameraman fast enough though, and he just captured it. Leonardo Jontero thinks going to take this one. He is, and Song didn't even manage to stop the timer, of course, that the climbers have to apply the appropriate amount of pressure in the correct part of the pad, otherwise their time does not stop. So you can see the clock's still ticking away there for Song. So he's been looking forward to Paris for a long time, shakes his head disappointed with that result but it's great to see him back in the IFSC even if it was for less than seven seconds but great to have him back he is one of the legends of the sport Alex just looking forward to 2020 then with the speed um, a lot of the uh, climbers um, who, who are potentially going to 2020 Olympics will be from the boulder and the lead disciplines in four years do they have enough time to get as good as these guys at speed do you think I think they can get really very close. I don't think they'll be breaking world records, but I think we could see sub seven seconds. Um, to, to get the world record, you do, I would say, have to focus on speed, but I, I think they can get really close. So on the left of your screen there, you can see on our graphics, Alexander Shikov, Jan Kriz of Czech Republic on the right. Shikov, of course, climbing for Team Russia, a very strong sport climbing nation. No less than four Russians out of our 16 competitors this evening in this men's speed climbing final. So we've got Shikov on the left, Chris on the right. Shikov got the better start. Chris was a bit slow out of the blocks, but he's reining him in. But Shikov, I think, is just about going to hold on to his advantage. He will now. Chris slipped about two thirds of the way up the route. Shikov lowers down. Job done. He advances. He'll take on the winner of our next race, Stanislav Kokorin against Dmitry Timofeev. Just noticed there, Charlie. Uh, Jan Chris on the right hand rope is potentially suggesting there's a technical incident on that wall. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. I'm sure the officiates will will drop in. Alex, have you ever had that before? Some, some slight bit of movement in the hole just throws you off. I've never had the hold move, but I've, I've had a rope go under my hand, um, which shouldn't happen, but it, you know these things happen. And that you know, completely throws you off if it's, if it's not quite right. So it's, it slows the comp down. And as a competitor, it's really annoying because you've wasted a lot of energy on that run and you might have to do it again, so. It seems to be uh, some discussion there about the validity of uh, that race. And I think 
just seen that Yanker has come off the stage. He's not quite in your view now. He's just off to the left as your picture as you look at it, and he's talking to one of the Czech coaches. And I certainly made the motion as if he was going to write on a piece of paper, which I strongly suspect means they're going to appeal that. We are using the also belay system here. If you watched our speed final in Arco, it was an absolutely extraordinary competition. We had ties, we had uh, multiple technical appeals. Daniel uh, Boldyrev involved in just about everything. He had a technical incident when the rope ended up impeding his ability to move. We had manual belaying there with the rope. This time we're using the also belay system. And he was also involved in an incident at the start where he seemed through uh, Basama Wem off his stride. But go back and check the Arco speed final if you want to see what I mean. Let's have a look at this incident with Chris. Well, personally, I didn't see anything in that. Uh, Alexander, is the expert, is there anything in that? I didn't see anything, but I think the original incident was slightly lower down than that. I think it was right at the start. Um, but I didn't catch what it was. It'd be interesting to see a replay of the earlier section. As I say, when he fell, it didn't look as if he was being impeded in any way by the also belay system. But we do certainly have some sort of a technical incident because none of the climbers have come out on stage as things stand. I can just see the officials running around uh, backstage here, so they are going to just go up and investigate that, we do believe. Give us a great opportunity to ask Badger Alex for a few more gems of information about speed climbing. Alex, what sort of training do you do and what do these uh, internationals do uh, when it comes to the speed climbing? What's different in terms of, you know, day-to-day -day training, are they using weights or are they sprinting or are they using fingerboards? What is it they do to get this good at speed climbing? It's, it's quite different to the other two disciplines of climbing. You need a lot more explosive power. So you're doing, you know, sprint training, maybe even step aerobics, you're doing weights in ways that just other disciplines of climbing aren't using. So a lot of people kind of imagine speed as sort of a series of dinos between the holds. It sort of is, but you're more continuously moving. It's not a set of individual dinos. So you're always moving. So it's almost like running up a flight of stairs with your hands as well. And as you need a huge amount of power endurance for it, especially as you get later into the knockout stages, because it's not just two runs in qualification. You have your two runs and then you just keep going. So. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Just on your screen here, we can just see one of the route setting team just checking that hold for, you know, like Alex said earlier, any tiny movement will affect. And as you can see on your screen there, that hold is moving. That is very rare. That probably shouldn't happen at the World Championship. So the route setters will be kicking themselves a little bit. Um, there may be a little bit of a situation with the wall. These holds are bolted on, but then they are usually pinned into place with screws. So it's, a, it's a quite rare for that to happen. That's pretty unfortunate. Um, but again, it means we have a bit more time to, to talk about it. One thing that's really interesting is the actual number of facilities in the world that are registered for World Cup walls, uh, World Cup and World Records. Yeah, it's, it's really not many. You, there's a quite a few speed walls around, but there's only a very small handful that can actually set a world record because the, the specifications are so tight. Um, there's a list on the IFSC site. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but it's a very small list. It's maybe 10 or 15, something like that. Yeah, what's interesting, also in Britain, where you train, there is two speed walls technically. One is, uh, is actually shorter than this 15-meter wall here um, in Sheffield. Um, so it doesn't, quite, it doesn't quite do it for the training, but it's pretty good. And where you're based in Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, the lead uh, speed wall there, sorry. Um, do you find you have the opportunity to get on that as much as you like, or would you like to see more speed walls around the world and in the UK? Well, I'm in university in Glasgow, so I'm not in Edinburgh all the time anymore. But when I was living in Edinburgh, the, the lack of speed walls the rest of the country wasn't a problem for me because I was in Edinburgh. But for the growth of the sport, I think it's going to be quite important uh, to get other walls, even if it's just like a single line and not a fully set out wall, because that's quite a lot of wall space. Yeah, absolutely. And as a wall manager in London, uh, as soon as the Olympic bid uh, was successful, we did have a think about whether a speed wall was something that we should look to include over the next four years so people can train. Um, the height is an issue for most walls in the UK, at least 15 metres is, is higher than most. Um, obviously, uh, in Edinburgh at the Rappo International, we have no issues with that. Um, but down in London, we could get the 10 metres set up, but uh, you know, walls are going to struggle a little bit. Uh, 
It is an official IMSC wall, and they do use it. I haven't competed internationally on that wall at one point, um, but it, it isn't the full thing, and it kind of feels very strange to compete on it because all the times everyone gets are extremely quick, um, and the whole event just seems sort of slightly wrong. But it is an IFSC official version of the wall, so. Yep, so Charlie's just had a look at the technical incident and we did see on screen there a slightly loose hold. Uh, Charlie, can you give us a bit more information on what went wrong, wrong, wrong there? Yeah, Jan Chris, the uh, Czech climber flagged that he thought there was a potential loose hold. It wasn't uh, where he fell. But uh, one of our resetting team has been up and corrected it. So we can get on with uh, our next race, which is an all Russian affair. Stanislav Kokorin will take on Dmitry Timofeev. Timofeev, of course, won in Chongqing, where I uh, mentioned we did some filming and we covered a, uh, a Boulder and Speed World Cup. Okay, here we go again. Back on with the speed competition after the technical incident. Stanislav on the left and Dmitri on the right. Good start by both fleets. Really equal on the wall at the moment. Stanislav slight lead. Stanislav looks like he's going to secure. Oh, nicely done. Stanislav Kuru Kukorin. Six. Two six one. Yeah, wins that by five one hundredths of a second. Yes, uh, just had a, a quick chat with the, our technical delegate Graham Alderson, and he tells me that uh, the incident involving Chris, he didn't fall off on the loose hold. It's not a technical incident. The race won't be rerun. There will be no change in the result because. Obviously, the hold can't have been that loose because he climbed past it successfully without it affecting his climb at all. But apparently, it was a, ve a very slightly loose hold. But having been tight, and that's the end of it, there won't be a rerun. Um, so, Alex and Charlie, just let us know at this stage in the competition is it pure knockout, uh, one on one, and one climber progresses to the next round? Yeah, so these, all of these are races. Whoever's fastest wins, and the other climber is out. So, it's, it's quite a brutal stage, this one. Up next then on the left-hand wall, uh, Danny Bulderev, current world record holder. Yes, uh, and here we take it on Ludovico Fasali, Italy. Where else could you be from with an Italy like Ludovico Fasali? But yes, uh, Dimitri Timofeev, as I say, already won World Cups this year. He would certainly be a man you'd have expected to uh, progress, but pretty tough round, Sanslav Kokorin. So we've got Polyrev on the left, current world record on Ludovic Fasali. Polyrev is a bit sluggish, but instantly made it up. Ludovic Fasali slipped pretty low down on the route. I don't know if Polyrev even saw him, but he didn't need to go quite as fast as he did in the end. But a pretty solid performance from Polyrev. 6.30. That was quite interesting there, Alex. Uh, Daniel Polyrev seemed to have a quite a slow start with a climber on the right. Uh, couldn't capitalize it on how to slip. We are talking about slips earlier. Now, how hard is it to hit these footholds? Once you learn them, you, you hit them almost eight out of 10 times, I would say, but if you have a slight lapse in concentration or you're, you're not quite 100% focused on it, it doesn't go quite exactly where it needs to and they're not big holds. So, especially the beginning three, you can miss them fairly easily and it's incredibly annoying. So the next race up, we have Marcin Zinski for Poland on the left and Georgi on the right. One of the things you see there is the athletes kind of, kind of, it looks like, a, like some sort of dance at the bottom there, but they're obviously, they have the muscle memory for each of the moves so well. What, it, what is it, what, you know, what do they, why are they doing that at the bottom? Is it just to get the right mindset or to fire, get the endorphins firing? What is it? Um, I think a lot of it's mental by, the time you're in a World Cup final like this, you're you know the route. It, it's route reading it, but you already know it, so it, a lot of it's mental. Here we go then, Martin versus Georgi, neck and neck so far, but oh, quite of a slip there. Looks like Martin's going to take it with 6.23 seconds. Great run there by 
Martin Zienski. Yeah, Martin Zienski, of course, one of the last three World Cups, an extraordinary hat trick. Anu Jobert matching him in the uh, women's speed climbing. Just take this opportunity to say massive thanks to Alex Bozzi, the GB record holder. He's going to make his way out of the booth. Yeah, so now we've uh, got somebody who knows the climbing scene just about as well as anybody. It's uh, Eddie Falk. He's our resident IFSC photographer. He goes to pretty much every event the IFSC run. Ed. For those of you who uh, aren't aware of your work, and by the way, if you ever see any IFSC official stuff, you are aware of Eddie's work on the Facebook and press releases and just about all our social media. But for people that don't know, you just tell them a little bit about you and your history in climbing. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So I am a professional climbing photographer based out of nowhere pretty much anymore. Uh, I've been on the road so long I don't call anywhere home. Oh, here we go, John Brosler's up against Lee Ball. Let's watch this real quick. John is the hot young kid out of the US. Oh, and Lee Ball's got the, yeah. That didn't work out so well. Good run for Lee Ball to start though. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Um, so, I am a Kiwi, so from New Zealand, and I climbed competitively through my late teens or through my 20s. And then I blew up my knee, it all went pear-shaped when I snapped my ACL. Uh, about 10 years later I came back into the sport as a photographer. I've been doing a lot of motorsport and I've been doing a lot of downhill mountain biking photography. And I brought that style, I guess, of like reading the movement and looking into where they're going. And bam, that's it. Like People like my photos and a few years later, well, I'm still here. Before we resume our uh, chat with Ed, we'll just tell you that we've got Bassam Awem. He's just watched his brother, Mikael, in the uh, Boulder final here in Paris. So we've got some Quentin Nambo against him on the right. So the French, uh, French crowd, I would imagine, will be very much uh, neutral here. Two French climbers. Bassam on the left, Quentin on the right. There is the crowd. 8,000 people in this arena. Absolutely extraordinary to see an audience like this for a climbing competition and wonderful for us as well. So, Bassa on the left, Bassa on the right. And it's Bassa who gets a better start. He's holding on to that lead. I think he's going to take this one relatively comfortably. He is 6.09. Fast time for this early in the competition. And that is the first round out of the way in this uh, men's speed final. And we can go back to uh, Eddie, the official IFSC photographer. So, Ed, you've just said earlier that you kind of live on the road now. Talk us through your year, because sometimes I kid myself that I travel a lot, and then I chat to you. Yeah, I'm definitely on the road more than, well, more than anyone I know. I mean, so far this year, across speed, boulder, and lead, I've done 15 World Cups and four, international, four other international competitions. I started the year in the US, uh, came across to the UK, Poland, back to the UK. Um, I've been to Switzerland, then across to Japan, back to India, back to Europe, across to the US, back to Europe now. Of course, I'm here until the Japanese, uh, sorry, the Chinese swing, and then I'm off to China for the comps there, then back to Cranj, and then Oh, we will see. And this is one of the main reasons I call myself professionally homeless now is it's not worth me renting anywhere because I'd only be there about two and a half months a year. So. I love it. Life on the road. We will resume in just a second. Razor Alley. Oh, exactly far on the left against Liam Mallard. And Terra on the right. And John Terra got a marginally better start. Man. We thought Shane is going to need to rein him in here. And he is doing pretty successfully. He's got a pretty narrow lead. There we go. That's what four of a second looks like in real time. Yeah, Razor, not that quick out of the blocks. Not that sharp out of the blocks, I guess you could say, Razor. We won't, we won't dwell on that. Head in hands all round. But yeah, not the best start from him, but he more than made it up. So, Eddie, during the IFSC competitions, we occasionally see you on the mat. Just explain to us what your role is and why occasionally you might creep into one of our camera shots. Okay, so when I came into the World Cups a few years ago, 
I was a bit disappointed in the lack of coverage for a lot of athletes below like the top 10 or the top 15 in any given comp because for a lot of these guys it might be their only opportunity to compete at a World Cup and if no one's bothering to take photos of them, if no one's bothering to catch that moment, that's a real disappointment. And a lot of these guys don't have the, the resources to have their own photographer. So I started doing that and over time then the IFSC asked me if I'd be the official photographer and I said, look, you know, it's what I do, I'd love to. And um, now I endeavour to get photos of everyone and the flip side of that, my my bonus is that I can shoot on the field of play in finals. Anyway, here we go with the next two. I'll hand you back to Charlie. So I've got an all Russian race here, Alexander Shikov on the left, Alexander Sucker Corin on the right. Corin, of course, knocked out of Egypt Timothy. And he's gone the right way about winning this one as well. Good start. Good for slip slow down there. Another couple of minutes allowed Shikov to catch him and pass it to Corin. Possibly should have taken that one. A couple of slips, one about a third of the way up and another one about two thirds of the way up. It definitely gets tricky for the speed climbers. The route itself is not terribly difficult. If you're a competent climber, you'll go up the route quite comfortably in 30 odd seconds. But for these guys trying to go under six, you're not looking down at your feet ever. You look at someone like Stan, his head is always facing up. His eyes are always up. He's only going off instinct where he should stand. And these little slips creep in. You see it more with the taller guys. You'll see people like Libor or Danielle. Um, Bassam Owen from France as well, they're way more prone to the slips, whereas the smaller compact climbers like Marcin, who's coming out now, really tend to be a little bit accurate on their feet, but of course they lose a bit of reach on the big guys. Yeah, this is a, uh, a big race to this early on in this speed final. We've got Marcin Zienski, winner of the previous three World Cups, extraordinary run he's on, taking on Daniel Boldyrev, the current world record holder. So, one of the big names in speed climbing is going to go out relatively early here. This last round of, this round of eight we're on now. So one of these two, the current world record holders and dominant force in speed climbing over the past few months. One of them will not be in the last four. And that was a classic example of the taller guy climbing. It's almost like wheel spin. His foot just floats straight over the hole, blows off the top of the hold, and it's run over. So those tall guys, they can really generate the speed, but with the longer, more gangly limbs, it holds them out from the wall, and uh, sometimes it goes south for them. All right, here, if you can't hear, well, if you can still hear me over the crowd, we're back to Bassa, the big home favourite. So, Charlie, call this one for us. Yeah, Bassa Moem's out, as I say, just watched his brother in the uh, bouldering final. Libor Horosa as well, the upper seat. Libor Horosa, I have to say. Yeah, all well with Libor. Absolutely enormous. The fact that we share so much of our DNA never ceases to amaze me. Apparently, I share 99% of my DNA with Libor Horosa. But when I'm stood next to him, you'd find it hard to believe. Ditto Bassa Moem, two big, powerful men. One of them's going to get knocked out here, though. Course was uh, suffering with a uh, tricep injury back in Arco. I asked him how he was, and he said, fit to compete. Who knows what that means? It means that in this race, he got a good start, but he slipped. And so is Bassa. This one's going to be tight, but Bassa takes it. Oh. Libor slipped there. Unbelievable. I was just in the middle of saying his answer to me when I said, How's the injury? is I'm okay to compete. So what that means, I don't know. I don't think, we'll have another look at the replay, but I don't think this was anything to do with the slight tricep injury he was carrying. Let's have a look. As Ed rightly points out, it's nothing to do with the tricep. As Ed rightly points out, the taller guys are more liable to slip. Sorry, there, Bassett also had a slip of his own. Yep, that can definitely happen. You can wear the leotard for less friction, but it doesn't save you if your foot falls off the hold. So 
An interesting thing about these guys, I know a lot of people don't rate the speed climbers as all-round climbers, but both of those guys that just went, I've seen climb. Libor's climbed 8B outside, which is superb, and I've actually been with Bassa at Chongqing after the World Cup last year, and he was on the men's final problems and doing really well. He is a superb boulder. Obviously the older brother of Mikel, who was just in the boulder final, and he is a monster in bouldering as well. It's so impressive to see him climb. The guy is a super all-round talent. And we had a, a lot of action to keep us busy there, but just going back to your uh, your photography, tell us how the, the competitions have, have changed from your perspective in the recent years. Well, I've always been a huge fan of competition, and there was always a few good photos, but not a whole lot of good photos. And so I've tried to bring my style in, and I guess a lot of people come back to me and say something which I think well, I take it as a compliment. I mean, obviously, I've got my Instagram, the circuit climbing, and the Facebook, and everything like that. And they turn around, they say, you make indoor climbing look interesting. And I think, to me, like, I'm a pa I was a passionate comp climber. I'm a huge comp fan. I used to watch the stream. And if I can capture that and show it to people and get them inspired, then I'm super psyched. And so, yeah. You're getting me psyched just sitting here, and we're watching it. That's a, that's a, you know, a really interesting point that people who climb outdoors may not necessarily have an interest in competition, but it is part of the movement that is getting people interested in this incredible sport. And right now, we've got a pretty incredible athlete on the stage, raised it, Ali Posh, Shana Zandifar. He'll be taking on Alexander Shana. was on the right, Ali Posh, Shana's on the left. Ali Posh, Shana bolts out the blocks. Holding on to his lead, it's going to be tight. Takes it by one hundred a second. I said just before they got there, it was going to be tight. There's Razor. I think he's quite happy. That's up. Call me a mind reader. Yeah, you got to love Razor. He's a super passionate guy. I spent a long time drawing on a piece of paper for him in Haiyang last year, trying to get him to the airport, and obviously he didn't speak any English at that stage, so drawing pictures of clocks and buses and planes and trying to get him from Haiyang back to Iran, which, you know, these are the challenges that face these guys from all over the planet, and we forget about this. We just see them for these 30 or 40 seconds they climb over the course of a comp, but of course they have come from every part of the world and if you win a Speed World Cup, you're probably climbing for under 40 seconds in competition. Yeah, it's a good point, Ed makes. We do a, a lot of travelling with the IFSC, although I've been covered not as much as Eddie, but it's, uh, it does affect the athletes, and they don't travel in luxury. There's no private jets and helicopters here. It's a really interesting point you make. So, crowd favourite, Basim Wem just beat Libor Horosa, no easy feat. Martin Zienski is also out. Polish climber. This is to join Razor Ali Poshena in the big final. Razor, of course, already guaranteed at least a silver medal. Who will he face to the side of the gold? Will it be Dzienski on the left or Mal Wem on the right? So Zienski, the winner of the last three World Cups, he's opened up a small lead, but Mal Wem's reining him in. This is going to be so tight. 6.06 .06 from Marcin. It wasn't nearly as fast as his previous run, that was 5.93, 6.06. It was a small slip, that was looking so tight until Bassa slipped in the very final stages. What's really interesting here in the speed final is the speed of the rotations between rounds, how fit these guys have to be. And for those sitting at home, just to give you a bit of an idea of how fast these guys are actually going, Daniel Bordereff, who unfortunately got knocked out, his current world record makes him travelling at a speed of 2.68 metres per second which is just under 10 kilometers an hour, uh, which is, by hands and feet speed, that is really, really fast. And if we could get on Twitter, hashtag Stato for, uh, for Mike Langley. Ed, I suspect with the small final and big final coming up, you maybe have somewhere to be, but we really appreciate you coming on. I think a lot of people really enjoy your photos, I know I do, and thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you coming Thanks. up Thanks, it's been a pleasure having this opportunity, but yep, I better go snap off a few hundred photos of the last couple of runs, so enjoy the rest of commentary. Yeah, I think if I had to answer the IFSC bosses and I had Eddie here while the big final was going on, I might not be very popular.
welcome back Alexander Bose in his place. Fascinating insight from uh, Eddie Falcon, of course, our official IFSC photographer. And Alexander, welcome back. We've got a question here from uh, Twitter, from Lewis Gibbons. He wants to know what sort of diet do you have for uh, speed climbing? I suspect from the, uh, the winky face and things, this might be someone you know. So we're straight back to you. What is your diet for climbing, Alexander Bosey? Fairly terrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, eating has not really ever been a, a strong point of mine. But um, yeah, I, I try to eat healthily and everything, and I think it is very important to compete at this level. But um, can't say I've ever done very well at it. Of course, uh, Alexander comes from Scotland, home of the battered Mars bar, iron brew, all the uh, superfoods. So thanks uh, to Lewis Gibbons. I suspect may know full well what uh, Alex's diet is like. You can't be dropping your guest in it just as they come back into the commentary booth. So up next we're going to have the, uh, the small final. As I say, this is what we would call the uh, third fourth playoff in most other sports. In the speed climber, call it the small final. That will be between Alexander Shikov and Bassa Mawem. They're the on the stage. And that will be followed by the big final. Inside the gold medal, that will be between Razor Ali Porshane and the man that's about to emerge out of the stage, Marcin Tiemensky. What a final that is going to be! We're going to have about six seconds. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. This is the Olympic 100 metres right here. I think if Razor takes this away tonight, Charlie, I think people in the front row are in danger. He is so so up for this. You can look at him and see the, the kind of the passion on his face and. All of these guys, incredible athletes. Just the, the speed that this final has gone on. Uh, it's, one, it's one of the few finals I've actually managed to see live and have the pleasure of seeing live. And it's just, it's just awesome entertainment. Yeah, I've said it before, I think speed climbing is possibly the least understood of the three climbing disciplines. I think that would be a fair way to put it. But I've said it before, I'll say it again. I've, personally, for me, I really think it belongs in the Olympics because if for no other reason, it's, they're incredible athletes, but this is the most Olympic of the disciplines, if that makes sense, because you have two guys, they take each other on, fast as one progresses, and it's a knockout system. You look at something like the 100 metres, probably the biggest 10 seconds in sport every four years is a men's 100 metre final in the Olympic Games. 10 second event, you get one shot, if you blow it, it's all over. If you get it right, you get the glory. And speed climbing is exactly the same. It's one shot for glory, with multiple races, multiple heats, so in a way there's that added element. But in the final, you get one go, and as I say, I think for the Olympics, it translates fantastically. It's two guys, they race, the winner, the first one to the top. Yeah, I don't know about you, uh, Charlie and Alex. I'm actually really, really excited to give this a proper go, so hopefully later on tonight we can actually have a little duel maybe up there. <laughs> Count me in, although Mike Langley, who uh, just said that, is a professional route setter, and I suspect marginally stronger than me. I don't know, let's throw Alex into the mix and we'll both just be standing there watching him fly up the wall. Alex Bosey, current record holder. Uh, we're just into the final stages of this speed final. What do you think so far? Has it been a great show? Yeah, I think it's been really good. We've we've had some really really good races, some of the really close ones, and only the one technical incident so far. So it's it's gone really quite smoothly, I think. Here they are, out onto the stage. The cheer, that man on the closest to the camera, faster my way, the cheer he gets. Drown out anything else you hear in this uh, speed climbing final. Very much a crowd favourite. France have already had a uh, bronze medal this evening. Of course, Manuel Cornu took bronze in the men's bouldering. How would love to have another one? This is the small final. This will decide who takes the bronze medal and who goes home in fourth place. Either Shikov or Omar Wem will be on the podium this evening, but which one of them? Just as the guys get clipped in, Charlie, I just can't comprehend the fitness of these guys. Multiple runs in a space of 20, 30 minutes. The fitness must be absolutely insane. Uh, Alexander Bosey next to us, his ego being inflated here. What? Oh, you must be such amazing shit. We'll, we'll come back <laughs> in a second. Yeah, something like that. So, Shikov on the left, Marwan on the right. 
and Marwem flies out of the block, but Zhikov better in the early third of the route. I think he's going to hold on to this advantage he's created. He is 5.95, flies under six seconds. Marwem didn't manage to stop the clock. He was so close there, Bata. Yeah, he was, Zhikov just managed to get himself a bit of a lead. I think Marwen was slightly quicker out the blocks, very marginally, but it's just that lower third of the route. Shikov just opened up a lead that he held on to. Can't quite see it from this angle. It looks from here as if Marwen's in the lead. He is in the lead. There yeah, we see it. Bassett just failing to stop the clock. Of course, you have to apply the pressure in the right place and the right amount of pressure to stop the clock. Bassett didn't quite manage it, but waves to this French crowd, which I think it would be fair to say have given him pretty good support. Yeah, Bassa definitely put on a good show there. Uh, for this huge French car, as we keep saying, but it was so close there. He obviously just knew he was slightly behind and just did everything he could to hit the buzzer and just missed it. it you know, the buzzer is really sensitive, but it's just fingertips off there. Here we go, then. Well, this is it. We were just talking then about the Olympic 100 metres. This is an Olympics right here. The World Championships comes around once every two years. You have six seconds to do or die. Both of these men guaranteed at least a silver. And I suppose a month or two or a year down the line, they might move back and be quite happy with the silver. But if they don't win this race, I think either of them, whoever doesn't win, will go home bitterly disappointed. They both didn't believe they can win here. Martin Zienski, of course, to say he's the form man is to put it mildly. Three World Cup wins in a row, an unprecedented hat trick from him. However, Razor Ali Porshane is lightning quick. He's so explosive. Just look at the size of him. He's already won a World Cup this year, won in Nanjing back in May. I hope you watched our coverage from Nanjing. We were in an amazing venue out in the uh, out in the sticks. Nanjing in a really cool rural venue. He won there. Will he win here? Razor Ali Borshena. He doesn't get quite as good a start as Zienski. And Zienski, I think, is going to add the World Championships. So three World Cups in a row. He is 5.83. He didn't need to go at world record pace because Razor Ali Porshena slipped relatively early on and you can see there Razor is lowering down. He did not want the silver medal. He was here for gold, but he won't take it because that man who in the latter part of the 2016 season just cannot be stopped has taken it from him. Marcin Zienski. Let's have another look at this again. Alex, where was this race won and lost? Just the second he slipped, uh, it's, at this level, it's so hard to recover a slip. You've, you've got six seconds to do the whole thing, and you, you slip and you waste half a second. Making that back is so difficult. I think the emotional here, uh, the emotion in the speed final here was just so intense. To have a slip like that must be just gut-wrenching for a razor. You can see just as he came down off camera, he was actually in tears as he got lowered to the ground by the auto belay system. And that concludes what was... For me, really exhilarating speed final. I'm really glad that we managed to get to see that live. Yeah, I think it was a really good final. Um, it is absolutely heartbreaking when you when you make a mistake like that because it's it's in the back of your mind that you you could have done this and you could have won it, but you you made a mistake and it, it's really hard mentally to, to cope with that. I find. So I think he'll he'll shake it off and he'll be back. Does that inspire you then, Alex, to get back uh, to, into training for speed, maybe come back at the next World Championships? Your current time for the British record is 9.2 seconds. These guys just under six seconds, three seconds. Can you make it? Uh, hopefully, but it's a long way to go. Well, maybe, obviously, you're no slouch in lead and boulder as well, so maybe you'll be training for the Olympics as well. It'd be nice. Um, total order, I, th I think, but uh, it'd be a pretty incredible experience. Well, I would say keep cracking on with the battered Mars bars and the bag of chips. Alex Bosey, thanks so much for joining us for the speed final. Insights have been really, really great, and uh, hopefully you guys at home enjoyed the speed here in Paris. Yeah, that was a, a fantastic event. Thank you very much from me to uh, Alexander for his help. And there we are. We're having a few microphone issues, which is uh, why you can see us sharing this one. Alexander didn't quite have time to escape before the camera came on us. Now that before this women's lead final, the athletes are just being presented. We will cut to them very shortly. Of course, we've got eight women, an incredibly strong lineup in this evening's women's lead final. We've just seen a fantastic men's final, Martin Zienski 
added to his recent three World Cup wins by winning the World Championships. Apologies again for the uh, slightly strange look with our microphone. We are down to uh, one microphone.